Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are here today outside of Safe Street's Cherry Hill in South Baltimore uh, for a very important announcement. Let us first uh, thanks to great, great folks from Safe Street's and Safe Street's Cherry Hill for all the work that they've done over the years and, and really uh, working to turn the story around and the, and the mode about what people say about Cherry Hill. Uh, it was here, this Safe Street sites, where we really, in my opinion, recognize the potential of such a great program with the great work that our interrupters have done throughout the years. I am joined today by uh, Director Jackson of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, uh, Dr. DeRaza, our Health Commissioner, Police Commissioner Harrison, uh, Deputy State's Attorney Jan Bledsoe, uh, am I missing anybody? That is, that is all. Uh, we may be joined by uh, some members of the council and a few. Uh, we all know that Baltimore continues to face severe uh, public safety challenges. Last year alone, we lost 335 Baltimoreans to violence, and we know that many more died from preventable, preventable overdose. Already this year, three and a half months into 2021, we have lost 54 people to violence in our city. Uh, the sheer uh, amount of this loss of life is staggering and something uh, that we can never be comfortable with. Uh, these aren't just numbers uh, or, or internet posts or one-time news story to me, and they shouldn't be to anyone in Baltimore either. Everyone in Baltimore is impacted by this disease that has been plaguing our city uh, longer than I've been alive. All of us know the feeling of losing someone, be it our neighbor, brother, sister, father, mother, friend, or whoever. Every person whose life was cut short leaves behind an entire community of people forever impacted by the loss and the trauma. Uh, we know uh, that violence in Baltimore has been disproportionately felt in our city's black and historically red line neighborhoods. And as I've said for years, at its core, uh, the violence that has a grip on our city is a public health issue. Yes, let me be very clear. Uh, police have a distinct role to play, uh, but we must also understand that police alone cannot stem the tide of violence. If the hardworking uh, women and men of BPD were the sole solution to our violence problem, uh, Baltimore would be the safest city in America based upon how we've operated during my lifetime. But they are not the sole solution. We need and we will have every single city agency across our city government involved. We need our community partners and grassroots organizations involved as they have been asking to be for decades. We need everyday Baltimoreans involved too. Each of you watching or listening out there, but it is first my responsibility to make sure that your entire government is working towards building public safety. We must ask what every agency and inter, uh, institution that interacts with our residents can do to stop violence, and we must do so with complete commitment and urgency. Changing the reality of violence, which has persisted uh, throughout my life in the great city of Baltimore, will absolutely take each and every one of us. When I became mayor in December, I was clear that building public safety in a comprehensive and coordinated way was my top priority. Thinking about and working towards making our city safer is something that I commit myself to each and every day. Let me also state this. While this may not and never will be overnight work, we must work tirelessly to build neighborhoods where the public health of our residents come first and whether the next generation of children can, where the next generation of children can grow and thrive. If we want to reduce crime and violence and actually sustain these reductions over time, then we need a comprehensive coordinated approach. As council president, I passed a law uh, requiring the mayor to develop and implement a coordinated public safety strategy. For me, uh, this has been the missing link in violence reduction efforts uh, throughout the city and throughout our time in the past. Today, uh, my administration is releasing a draft version of that plan for public feedback. You will remember that one of my first actions as mayor was establishing the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement 
This office is responsible for coordinating uh, this all hands on deck approach to building a safer Baltimore and working to assure accountability across our holistic violence reduction strategy. I'm proud to have Director Jackson leading that effort and know how committed she is, first and foremost as a Baltimorean and someone who knows the importance of working hand in hand with the community for the benefit of our city. Uh, before I turn it over to Director Jackson to outline the plan that her office will be tasked with coordinating, I want to give our Health Commission the opportunity uh, to discuss the process that she began uh, prior to uh, Director Jackson's arrival. Ms. Madam Commissioner. Good afternoon and thank you, Mayor Scott, for your bold leadership in centering public health into a holistic violence reduction framework for Baltimore City. Today, I'm here to discuss briefly the public health approach that Baltimore City will be utilizing to address violence in our communities and the steps we have taken so far. Witnessing violence or living in a violent community is a social determinant of health, and it shapes our lives and overall health outcomes, meaning the environment in which we live, work, grow, play, and worship influences our quality of life. Addressing these social determinants of health is crucial to violence prevention. To combat this, the city is taking a three-pronged public health approach to violence by addressing the social determinants of health, responding to addiction and mental health needs, and promoting upstream investment to reduce violence. On May 18, 2020, in the wake of a global pandemic and a violence epidemic, then City Council President Brandon Scott passed the biennial comprehensive violence prevention plan ordinance as a sustainable response to reduce gun violence and address its root causes. The ordinance mandated that the Baltimore City Health Department develop a comprehensive violence prevention plan that employs a public health approach and strategies that are trauma-informed, reduce harm, and heal individuals and communities. On September 17, 2020, the Health Department began convening a multi-sector citywide violence prevention task force composed of Baltimore City agencies and organizations, Maryland state agencies, and federal government technical assistance partners. The task force met over eight sessions to develop a violence prevention framework using a results-based accountability approach. During the first four sessions, the task force selected results, identified indicators, and began a turn the curve process, starting with the root cause analysis. The four results chosen were, to, were for people who live, work, and visit Baltimore City to have equitable life opportunities, equitable life expectancy, that they be safe and are thriving. Recognizing the importance of involving the community in the planning process, the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute and the Mayor's Office of Performance Innovation were enlisted to support the drafting of a community engagement strategy for public comment on the framework. On November 12, 2020, the Health Department presented four desired results with corresponding indicators. The task force brainstormed evidence-based, community-based, and innovative strategies for public comment through the development of a survey promoted through various mediums, including the city's website. While the citywide violence prevention framework was undergoing pub public comment, on December 23, 2020, Mayor Scott established the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement and charged that office with leading citywide efforts in addressing crisis levels of gun violence today, while also addressing broader social determinants of health for a safer and more equitable Baltimore tomorrow. On January 8, 2021, the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, or MONSI, began working with the Health Department and a range of partners to develop the strategic plan here today that reflected key recommendations from the Mayor's Public Health and Safety Transition Committee, complemented the Baltimore Police Department's Crime Reduction and Departmental Transformation Plan and aligned with the framework developed by the Citywide Violence Prevention Task Force. Monsey's plan reflects the agency's lead role in fulfilling the framework's results to make Baltimore safer by addressing gun violence, while also leading community engagement, interagency coordination, evaluation, and accountability for addressing the broader social determinants of health. In the coming months, Monsi will engage community members, city agencies, and a variety of stakeholders to co-produce the city's operational plan for public safety, focus on the prevention of violence and the promotion of healing 
through an equity-based, healing-centered, and trauma-informed approach. Building on the initial framework, focus on all who live, work, and play in Baltimore, Monsi will expand the task force membership to include youth, the business community, community-based organizations, and other stakeholders. The Baltimore City Health Department remains steady in our support of Monsi, BPD, and other city agencies to incorporate public health recommendations into the city's overall violence reduction plan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jaraza. Thank you so much, and thank you for your work. Uh, we have been joined by Councilman Mark Conway, the chair of the Council's Public Safety Committee, and uh, Brittany Lewis from the Council President's Office, and also Deputy uh, Mayor for Public Safety, Sonny Schnister. We will now uh, turn it over to Director Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your vision and Commissioner DeRosa for convening the task force and creating the framework for the five-year plan. And I can't begin without thanking our Cherry Hill Safe Street Site Director, Elgin Maith, also known as Juice, for hosting us today. This site has been here for 13 years and demonstrates what partnering with the community to co-produce public safety truly looks like. Not only has this site gone 365 days without a homicide, twice, it also hasn't had a shooting or a homicide in this post since June 23rd, 2020, proving that it is possible for us to end gun violence in our city. Many thanks to Juice, his team, community partners, and Family Health Center for continuing to do this work. Now let's talk about the plan. Past public safety practices have failed to yield long-term results for Baltimore. As a city, we have not kept our community safe from violence and harm. We are sorry. Let me say that again. We are sorry. And we are explicitly breaking from past practices to reimagine new ways to reduce violence and ensure public safety. Doing what we've been doing is no longer an option. One life lost in our city is one too many. One person not able to live a high quality life is one too many. The Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, or MONSI as we call it, has drafted a plan based on our review of BPD's crime plan, the Mayor's public safety priorities, the Health Department's violence prevention framework, and most importantly, community voices as shared through the Mayor's Public Health and Safety Transition Committee recommendations. Like many plans before it, our plan is data and research driven and results oriented, but we didn't stop there. My teammates and I sought to create a plan that is equity-based, healing-centered, trauma-informed. We understand that real justice is about more than punishment. It's also about restoration about renewal, about healing. The plan is partnership-based and rooted in trust through transparency. The plan leverages prevention, intervention, enforcement, reentry, and rehabilitation strategies and methodologies within its three pillars. The first pillar is leveraging a public health approach to violence. Within this pillar sits gun violence prevention, victim services, youth justice, community healing, and reentry. Let's not mince any words. Violence is a public health issue. Gun violence is a public health crisis that disproportionately impacts black neighborhoods in Baltimore City. Co-creating the healing of neighborhoods with community members, city agencies, and organizations is the city's way forward. You all have heard the mayor talk about the Group Violence Reduction Strategy, or GVRS. Our partners at the state's attorney's office, BPD, state and federal level, have been doing the groundwork associated with this strategy for about a year now. We are grateful to them, and we look forward to deepening our partnership. This strategy relies heavily on strong collaboration between community members, support and outreach providers, and law enforcement to directly engage with folks who are at the highest risk of being a shooter or being shot, 
to not just keep them safe, but to provide opportunities for a high quality of life. The work of gun violence prevention also means that we need to make investments in our Safe Streets program to strengthen and support it. Along with our partners, we'll be working to provide safety and supports to survivors of crime, implementing pre-arrest diversion programming for our young people, and standing up a reentry council. Addressing broader social determinants of health have a direct impact on acts of violence committed in neighborhoods. Entire communities have been treated as dangerous. Instead of resorting to over-policing neighborhoods that have experienced disproportionate amounts of trauma, addressing the root causes of violent acts creates opportunities for neighborhoods to heal. The second pillar is community engagement and interagency collaboration. Sustainably addressing violence and structural inequity requires an intersectional approach. Just as individuals have their own unique needs, so do our neighborhoods. It's important for folks across Baltimore to engage in the process of actively healing, both for themselves and for their community. Community capacity building is at the core of this pillar. Not only will Monsi directly engage with elders, parents, young people, institutions, businesses, and community-based organizations around ideas associated with the co-production of safety, but we will also provide technical assistance and funding to grassroots organizations who are doing the work. The city is responsible for proactively addressing the needs of residents, not just reacting to issues as they arise. Monsi has been tasked with driving cross-system accountability among local, state, and federal agencies serving our city. We will be their accountability partner, and you will be ours. The third pillar is evaluation and accountability. As I mentioned before, our plan will be driven by data, evidence, and community-based best practices. We will be creating key indicators that assess our holistic approach to violence and we'll be sharing those metrics, data, and experiences to keep agencies accountable for their contribution to public safety. The team and I are really excited about a new tool that we'll be developing called Neighborhood Stat. We know that safety looks and feels differently to our neighbors who live in Morrill Park than those who live in Darley Park than those who live in Roland Park. Neighborhood stat will be a way for us to understand each neighborhood's current situation, including their assets or assets that are needed for improvements to public safety. The Monty plan is comprehensively concise as it outlines our strategy and not the detailed tactics that will be deployed when implement implementing the strategy. The operational plan cannot be created without a shared vision of what Baltimore looks like when our work is finished. I share that as a precursor for what's next. Your feedback. Feedback can be provided in multiple ways, either directly on our website at monsi.baltimorecity.gov or via Facebook sessions that will be scheduled where folks will hear about the plan and then have breakout room discussions about components of the plan. We'll also be scheduling time with partner agencies, neighborhood associations, businesses, and more to workshop the plan. I'll close by saying this. We need everyone, the whole weight of Baltimore City, from public agencies to community partners to institutions to businesses, to take a look at the draft plan and provide your feedback. We cannot do this without you. We don't want to do it without you. We're asking every Baltimorean to join us as partners in co-producing public safety. Thank you. Thank you, Director Jackson. Uh, this draft comprehensive public safety plan recognizes that violence is a public health issue uh, one that must be addressed through community engagement and collaboration between agencies. As, and I just want to reiterate, we want to hear from you. 
Uh, to provide your feedback, please go to monsey.baltimorecity.gov. And additionally, in the coming weeks, this plan will be before uh, the city council and councilman, councilman Conway's committee. Uh, deep challenges require creative, coordinated solutions. We are not going to solve this problem by doing the same things that we have done uh, for at least the 36 years, almost 37 years that I've been taking breath. I know that Baltimore can embody what it means to treat violence as a public health epidemic. I look forward to working with everyone standing here with me today and everyone watching this press conference and will see the video or read a story in a newspaper to implement this plan and truly and truly work towards building public safety in Baltimore. And at this time, we will take a few questions. First. Barry, Alexa, Hello. Alexa Hello. beat you, Barry. Hello. I, <laughs> forgive me because I walked up a little bit late, but when do you hope or expect to see some results as a result of this plan? So, uh, Alexa, again, you, I know you did miss this. Again, we talk about this plan, right? And this is the framework of their plan. But the most important part of that, you cannot go out and implement something for people without their input. And the most important part of this plan is starting to take effect after today but we know the coordination all of that work work all of the work that has already been done will start to see results very quickly but the most important portion hasn't happened yet we have to go to the citizens uh, as one of my former colleagues uh, councilman inspector would say you don't ask the doctor if the medicine is working you ask the patient and now we have to ask the patient Barry One of the things that was dis one of the things that was discussed was dealing with funding and uh, dealing with uh, uh, community support and going out and dealing with other how are you going to fund all those things? What kind? Where's the funding going to come from? So Barry, those are the kind of things that we're going to be discussing as we go through the co the partnerships and building them with the community, right? This is also about how we prioritize our budget moving forward with the city. But as we go out, talk to our community partners, see what their needs are. This is how we do it. The same uh, way that we went from having four safe street sites to ten, uh, the city had to make investments in the things that we knew would work in order to uh, have the results that would happen. If you would have tell it to me when I was 15 or 16 years old that Cherry Hill would go twice, twice, two years without having a shooting or homicide, I would have laughed at you and walked away. But we know because we made that change and the city made that commitment to changing the way it operates, we were able to do that. But what's going to have to happen here, this is a partnership. We're going to go to our partners in the philanthropic community. The city's going to have to put up. The state's going to have to put up. We're going to work with our federal partners. And all of that is going to be on the table. Also, youth. You talked about uh, incorporating youth. How are you going to do that? What exactly are you going to do to, to bring youth to even look at the plan and and all those things? Well, I, I'll let Director Jackson tell you exactly how she's going to do it. I know this this is the part that she's the most excited about. Director? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for your question. I would say as the former co-chair of the mayor's transition committee on youth education and recreation, we were able to convene a large panel of youth to participate in conversations about opportunities that they're looking to have afforded to them. My office is currently in uh, discussions with many other agencies, but the mayor's office of children and family success are currently spearheading a charge to host a mayoral youth summit in which we will be discussing public safety specifically with as many youth as who want to have a seat at the table um, will be there. Dave? This one is for Jackson. Can you just uh, describe a little more about the neighborhood stat and how that plans to take form? Because you said it's very specific to this plan. Actually, I'll take that, take that, Dave. This is something that we've talked about even throughout my campaign. Uh, we know that I have restarted city stat. We have police stat. We have clean stat. We have all these stats. Uh, one of the things that I talked about now over a year ago is that looking at how our agencies are working in specific neighborhoods. That means bringing every agency that we have under my power and looking how they're working in Santel or Cherry Hill, looking at the difference between their response time and how quickly things get closed out, looking at where we need to act Activity, what things that they don't have, making sure that we're holding our agencies accountable for treating every single neighborhood the same way.
Thank you, everybody. <laughs>